Hello, um, this is Megan Gillespie, genetic counselor at Fulgent Genetics um, here in Los Angeles. Um, we're just about to get started on the um, sharing our newest test, our chromosome sequencing analysis, um, which combines genome-wide copy number analysis uh, along with whole exome sequencing. Um, and we think this test has the potential to streamline the testing process for your practice um, and maximize the, the chance to get a diagnosis for your patients. So our speaker here today is Dr. Sam Strom. He's a American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics Lab Director um, in Clinical Medical Genetics. And after doing his graduate work at uh, Dr. Stan Nelson's laboratory at UCLA, he did a research postdoc with uh, Michael Gorin at the Jules Stein Institute um, working on Stargardt's disease, um, and also did clinical training with Dr. Wayne Grody. Um, he joined us at Fulgent earlier this year, and we've been really, really happy to have him. He's helped design and implement um, our two newest tests, our expanded carrier screening um, beacon test, as well as our chromosome sequencing analysis, which we'll be talking about today. Um, Dr. Strom's talk will be about 45 minutes, and then we'll respond to some questions. Um, please use the chat feature um, of the webinar to submit questions at any time. Um, and if we don't get to yours, uh, we will respond offline. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And you know, Sam, take it away. All right, thank you, Megan. So yeah, we're really excited today uh, to talk about chromosome sequencing analysis. This is kind of kind of uh, something we've been you know building towards for a long time. It's really a culmination of what we do here at Fulgen, and uh, you know it's it's exciting for us to be able to share this with everyone at this point. So uh, if you're not familiar with our lab, uh, we have a broad testing menu, everything from single mutation, uh, single site analysis, all the way through genome-wide CNV and whole exome testing. We even do uh, a, a small amount of whole uh, genome sequencing as a clinical test. Uh, and so really trying to think about where our menu is and what we can potentially offer, we saw this possibility of combining the genome-wide copy number analysis with whole exome analysis to have a flexible and affordable genetic test uh, that you can use uh, to, to streamline your practice. Uh, so this is adapted from some ACMG guidelines for uh, testing recommendations for individuals with intellectual disability and developmental delay. It really works uh, as a framework uh, for uh, pediatric, neonatal, uh, and, and other uh, cases that are syndromic uh, as well, uh, you know, major congenital malformations, things of that nature. You know, the, the, the take home from this is that if you think you know what single condition a patient has, uh, then you just send a single gene test or maybe a, a small panel. And that diagnosis is confirmed with a pretty high rate. So, you know, the studies have shown conclusively that medical geneticists and genetic counselors are very good at their job. Uh, so when uh, there's a strong suspicion of a single gene disorder, uh, that's correct 75% of the time or more. And that's pretty simple. The problem is that if that's negative or if there isn't anything obvious, then you're on this other side of the tree where there are really a lot of decision points to make. So if you look at this, each one of these blue dots is, is a different decision that has to be made, a test that needs to be ordered, a, a visit with a patient, you know, some, some work needs to be done. Uh, and it's not sort of straightforward how to proceed through here. It also can get extremely expensive if you follow this uh, to the line, if you're doing, you know, so if you're not suggestive of a clinical condition, you're doing a microarray for CNVs and Fragile X, uh, that's negative at least 80% of the time. Uh, so you're, you're positive maybe 10 to 20% of the time, depending on the condition. Uh, and then if you don't, at least from published data, you, your, your mileage may vary. Uh, but when a diagnosis, the diagnosis is not established, then it's saying you should do a panel or potentially exome maybe a panel, then exome, and at this point, you've done a large number of tests. You've had a lot of uh, consults. You've had to discuss a lot of different results. Um, so, you know, the, the reason for all this is because the, the methodologies are so disparate. So if you want to test for large chromosomal abnormalities, uh, microdeletions, duplications, UPD, uh, and then also small variants, re uh, repeat expansions and pseudogenes and all these things, you need, there are different methodologies uh, to, to approach these that have been developed at sort of different time points. So microarray came on first, 
Then you have things like exon arrays. Well, obviously karyotypes came on first. So I'm not going to skip that. But microarrays came on, and then uh, exon arrays, and then panels and NGS exome testing. You know, so there's sort of this iterative history, but we can actually do almost all of this at once with chromosome sequencing analysis. Um, so certainly. This test covers large microdeletions and duplications. It covers exon level deletions and duplications. It covers single nucleotide and small insertion deletions. We also are including uh, one repeat expansion test, for example, Fragile X, uh, as part of this test. That's a separate methodology, but we're bundling it. And then we also have uh, UPD analysis and pseudogene SOPs that are built into our, uh, our NGS pipeline. So this allows you to sort of skip all these different decision points, make one decision, order CSA, and get a single result that has uh, this entire tree. And we think this is uh, efficient uh, both from a use of time and interaction with patients, but also uh, from a cost perspective, which we can talk about sort of at the end. But this is, again, a single test that can detect large CMBs, small variants, exon level delts and dupes, uh, UPD, potential UPD and uh, Fragile X as well. So how are we doing this? Uh, just like there are many different microarray platforms that were developed first oligo and back arrays and then SNP arrays to develop to detect CNVs, we can now detect CNVs by next generation sequencing. <clears throat> so uh, Fulgen has been offering deletion duplication analysis on, on uh, NGS data for the past three years. This is always coupled with uh, QPCR or MLPA confirmation. So we use the next generation sequencing uh, coverage analysis. We have a, a proprietary algorithm called CNV exon, which detects signals of, uh, of exon deletions when there's at least two exons in a row that are either duplicated or deleted. And then we confirm those with QPCR. And that has a very, very high sensitivity for uh, multi exon deletions and duplications. And when you apply that, to large structural variants, uh, it's extremely powerful and, and has a very high sensitivity for any CNV that includes at least two exons, so at least one gene. Most, you know, nearly all of the uh, clinically relevant CNVs that are reported have at least one entire gene, and that's, uh, that's actually a very strong signal for us. Uh, so this, this diagram is the normalized coverage across the entire chromosome 12, where a one is, is uh, normal coverage, so that's, uh, that's uh, diploid, so two copies, uh, and each dot is an exon, and so instead of a microarray probe, this is exon coverage, and you can see at the distal Q arm of this chromosome, there is a very large duplication, so this is about six megabases, it included many genes, uh, and it's sort of a typical type of finding on a microarray. This analysis is actually uh, We've, we've validated down to about 100 KB resolution, as, again, as long as there are uh, genes involved. So as part of CSA, the first thing we do is this GMY copy number analysis. If it's positive, if we have uh, a large del or dupe that includes an OMIM gene, for example, uh, and, or is it a known recurrent del or dupe, uh, we'll do confirmatory studies. Like I said, we'll do that qPCR to make sure it's truly there. And then if you submit parents along with the specimen, we'll do the testing in the parents at that time as well. Uh, that will be the qPCR confirmatory testing, so we can see if it's de novo or inherited from a parent. And again, if it's positive, it's, if it's likely pathogenic or pathogenic, uh, we will report that out, and that's a positive result, and you're done. If it's not positive, then we move to whole exome sequencing, which is the process of finding a needle in a haystack, as you guys well know. So. I'm very excited. Uh, I'm not taking much of a Christmas break this year, but I'm going to Paris in January. So I'm getting excited to go to the, the Orangerie and Musée d'Orsay, so I picked some haystacks here for you. Um, the, the, the job of, of doing this is completed at Fulgent by our curation team. Uh, these are some of the folks who, at Fulgent in Los Angeles who do this work. Um, so you know, we'll, talk, we'll sort of talk about how you know, the ACMG guidelines are implemented, and we have uh, machine learning and algorithms and all these fun things, but at the end of the day, uh, it's the people who get it done. So we have a, an outstanding team of uh, laboratory genetic counselors and a lot of PhD scientists here at Fulgent uh, in Los Angeles and also Atlanta. We have a second team uh, who do this work. So our whole exome sequencing analysis, which is part of CSA, 
uh, is really a phenotype driven process. So uh, we can really de deliver the best results when we get the most detailed clinical notes. So here's a pitch to give us as much information as you can. Um, we do provide sort of these check boxes uh, to give a sort of high level view, but we really prefer during this process to get get as much as you can send. You know, obviously a, a clinical summary uh, is great, but even just the notes that you have are so valuable for us to do this analysis. Because the next step is we take that clinical note, we turn it into a list of, of phenotypic keywords, and we use those keywords to search for genes. So this is a tool that we have in-house. It's based on uh, OMIM and, uh, and you know, gene ontology language that I'm sure you're familiar with, where you, you can uh, associate genes with conditions. Uh, and some of these are very, very broad. You can see the inborn genetic diseases category has 277 genes. Uh, and then some things are more specific. Uh, and then we also have the ability to add fulgent panels here where we've, we've developed. So if this patient, for example, had a cardiac arrhythmia, we can just go ahead and add the entire cardiac arrhythmia panel to this, uh, the, the gene list to make sure that we, we spend the most time focused on genes within that gene list. We take a broad approach here. We're not trying to identify the patient. Uh, we're not trying to uh, diagnose the patient based off their clinical note. We're here to do genetics and genomics. Um, but we realize that you know, while the causative gene is often in a very strong phenotypic match, sometimes it's in a very you know, a weaker phenotypic match. And occasionally, uh, especially with the, the more recent uh, publications, uh, the causative gene might not actually be in a phenotype database anywhere yet. Um, so we do still uh, understand that some of these variants are going to fall outside the gene list. So we don't, uh, we don't ignore variants outside the gene list. We just focus our efforts on the, in the strong and in the, the weak uh, gene list matches. And then we, we look at the strongest uh, variants outside the gene list. So we do follow the ACMG guidelines here. We have a, a, an internal database that uh, curates, that tracks our curation over time. Um, and if you've ever tried to do this work, uh, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly and you know, we may have hundreds of variants for a whole exome to analyze. So we've really tried to organize our curation into different concepts. And you'll see this uh, on our reports that we sort of, uh, we make, when we decide to report a variant, we make uh, a clinical interpretation uh, based on these concepts. So whether the variant is heterozygous or homozygous, that's kind of important. Uh, what type of variant? Is it a missense or a loss of function? Uh, has this variant been published in? That's variant in cases. Uh, the control database, we're now using NOMAD for that. Uh, all these different types of things. So we'll, we will actually provide this type of information organized in this way on our reports so that it's easy for us to understand why we reported something and then hopefully uh, easy for you to understand why we reported it and classified it the way we did. Uh, we do have a ranking algorithm that we've developed here at Fulgent uh, that uh, uses things like population frequency, databases, internal data, algorithms, and other things to, uh, to, to uh, prioritize which variants to look at. Um, this is something that I'm very interested in developing over time that we can uh, improve our, our detection rate and, and also efficiency and turnaround time and things like that. Because that's still the hardest part is this curation of, of many variants. Uh, there are two areas that I want to highlight as particular strengths of our lab for interpreting variants. One is splicing analysis. Uh, so we call variants out to 20 bases into introns, uh, as well as uh, uh, potential known pathogenic variants that might be a little beyond that. Uh, and we also do coding, uh, we do uh, splicing predictive algorithms for even missense and synonymous variants. And that's part of our ranking algorithm. So if something is synonymous but uh, has some prediction that it, it, it may cause a splicing defect, that will cause our curators to look more closely. Uh, and looking closely is looking at even more algorithms to look at the sort of pattern of, of uh, splicing, whether a variant appears to disrupt a canonical splice or activate a new cryptic splice site, uh, and also the conservation. So I think we do a really good job here. That's something uh, coming from UCLA to here, I was very impressed to see how a Fulgent approached this. The other area is in pseudogenes which can be a, a real challenge for next generation sequencing, uh, both uh, false positive results and false negative results, which are in some ways even more scary. Uh, so as you know, some genes have 
uh, non-functional pseudogenes uh, either adjacent or somewhere else in the genome. And what can happen is you can have a uh, mutation in the real gene, which makes it look more like the pseudogene, which would not be called as a variant. It would be called at, it would just be a no call because the reads would simply map to the pseudogene instead of the real gene. The opposite can also happen where you have a mutation in the pseudogene that makes it look more like the real gene, and that will actually make it look potentially like there is a mutation in the real gene when really it's just there's a mutation in the pseudogene. So we do a special analysis called misalignment analysis that actually looks at where the reads are mapping compared to controls, and we're able to identify in uh, over 20 genes now sort of the unique patterns that those genes have. So if you think of uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the CYP21A2 gene, Gaucher disease, the GBA gene, uh, you know, spinal muscular atrophy, SMN1, SMN2, uh, we have this misalignment analysis for those kinds of genes, which gives us really good sensitivity uh, as, as part of this test. So that's part of all Fulgen tests that include those genes, uh, which even, even out to a whole exome. We also recognize that uh, uh, UPD detection is a major uh, step forward that uh, the SNP array era brought us. So when you know, SNP arrays are able to detect large regions of uh, absence of heterozygosity or areas of homozygosity, AOH, or runs of homozygosity, you'll hear it different ways. We use this AOH term because really what you're seeing is, is large stretches of the genome that have uh, homozygous variants uh, by by next generation sequencing, but the underlying mechanism of that is they've inherited the same chromosome twice from one parent, which can cause, uh, or at least part of a chromosome, which can cause uh, imprinting defects such as Prater Willi or Angelman, Angelman syndrome. Um, so we actually do call uh, homozygous blocks uh, over two megabases, uh, even and with best sensitivity about five megabases, uh, and this allows us to detect signals of, of these diseases. So we focus in on uh, the, the half dozen or so different regions of the genome which are very strongly associated with imprinting defects. So we, we search for whether there's homozygosity there. And then for some of the key ones we have, like Prater-Willi uh, Angelman, we have uh, methylation sensitive MLPA where we can actually detect the methylation status. Um, if you suspect Prater-Willi Angelman, you can actually request that as well as an add-on. Uh, it's not something we typically would do uh, unless we see this UPD signal. Obviously, there are other mechanisms uh, that can cause those syndromes, but we're happy to talk about how we can detect those. So exon-level deletion du duplications, this is something that's another major advantage of doing CSA over a standard microarray. So standard microarrays have a resolution of about 100 KB. Some go lower down to 50 KB. Uh, and there are available exon arrays that, that target the that target exon by exon, uh, but those those have not really been widely adopted compared to SNP arrays, which are the most most common. Um, so uh, this is an actual fulgent result of a patient uh, who had cystic fibrosis, uh, had a delta F508 mutation on one chromosome, and a three exon deletion on their other chromosome. So we see here again the dots are exons. Uh, so these three exons have 50% coverage compared to the the normal controls, uh, and so that's these three exons right here, which was detected the, by an NG, the NGS uh, CMV exon algorithm. We then do qPCR confirmation for those exons, as well as uh, adjacent exons, which we assume are negative. And then we throw in some controls every, uh, to make sure that they look like they're normal. Uh, so this result is pretty clear that there's a heterozygous uh, deletion. So we have this very sensitive screen by NGS and then a gold standard confirmation. Uh, this is, you know, NGS coverage uh, is a noisy signal. Uh, we know this. Uh, it, it, coverage is, is fairly consistent from sample to sample, uh, but you see a lot of noise within one to two standard deviations uh, of normal. And so at, at this point, we've tuned our cutoff to be permissive to increase our sensitivity. So from our perspective, a lot of the QPRs, QPCRs we do turn out to be normal. Uh, it looks like there might be a two or three exon deletion. We do the QPCR, so it looks totally normal. It was just noise in the NGS data. 
but you never need to see that. You know, we'll do that all behind the scenes. Uh, and so when there really is a true deletion or duplication, we have we will detect it, uh, but you won't have to worry that it's, that it's a false positive because we know that NGS generates a lot of false positive uh, CNV calls. So we have this this sort of screen and catch system for for CNVs, which has been very effective. So expanding the workflow a little bit, uh, if you're if the genome wide copy number analysis is negative or, or uncertain. If there's a VUS only, um, we will trigger the whole exome sequencing component. And that will include uh, exon level CNVs, uh, area of homozygosity, or absence of heterozygosity, uh, AOH uh, for UPD analysis, as well as small variants, the SNVs and indels that are typical of whole exome sequencing. At that point, we would also do full sequencing of the parents if the trio is ordered. Um, so we, we we do full exome sequencing on the entire trio. We can also support doing larger family structures. Just talk to us, um, and, and we'll be, you know, if there's an affected, if there's two affected SIDs and a, a quad study is appropriate, we can, we can support that as well. Our final reports, um, this is something we've been working really hard on to make, uh, to make reports that have a cleaner look and, and are easier to understand. So this is uh, page one from a chromosomal sequencing analysis. Results, I've blocked out the genes and variants uh, to, to maintain uh, PHI here, but this is, this is a, a standard type of report for, for, for this case. So you can see, first of all, this, isn't, this is a negative result, so there's no uh, diagnostic finding. But there were two variants identified uh, that were, are potentially clinically relevant. So there are two VUS, one from mom, one from dad, in the same recessive gene. Uh, and this happens, as you guys know, sometimes if you can't get all the way to likely pathogenic, even if you have uh, two variants in trans. You know, so we are following the ACMG guidelines uh, pretty, pretty carefully here. Um, but uh, you know, this, is, this is sort of how the results will be. We have these, these two different tables of the clinically significant variants up here, which is where diagnostic results would go. So if, if these were both pathogenic or likely pathogenic, this whole table will be bumped up to this clinically significant section. Uh, this additional variant is typically VUS. It may also contain uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in recessive genes if it's a single HET, something like that, where it's not diagnostic, but it's still important to report. That's why this table isn't called VUS. Uh, I, we, we're sort of working on this. This is still something we appreciate feedback on because there is, there's been a little bit of feedback that this potentially clinically relevant might be confusing in certain cases. So that, that might change a little bit, but um, really we think of it as here are the diagnostic variants here, here are other variants we're reporting, and then the genome-wide copy number analysis is here. So we would also have a table if this is positive for a VUS. Uh, and then we have notes and recommendations on the first page. These can be broad. Um, they're typically uh, just describing sort of the analysis that was done and recommending genetic counseling. Occasionally we will have more specific recommendations that go in here. It's always, a, you know, a, the type of thing we want a patient to know on the first page of the report, uh, the, the provider uh, would go there. The second page of our report, uh, this is a dummy gene and variant. I just picked it out of the blue, so don't, don't read it too carefully. But this is the type of information that we're going to provide on the, on the next page of the report for each gene and variant. So to kind of walk through this, we have a section about the gene where we have uh, the, the conditions associated with that gene, maybe a, a description of the phenotype um, and the modes of inheritance. And then we have uh, the name of the protein and a link to the OMIM page. Um, is the, anything that's blue is, a, is a, an active hyperlink in a PDF, uh, or if you go online, to receive the results. Uh, then we have this sort of table combined with bullet points for every variant. So in this case, there's only a single variant, uh, and it's classification. So we have, again, we sort of organized this table into those ACMG classification concepts that we use that we think help organize, you know, why are we classifying a variant the way we are. So we have the type of variant, so it's a missense mutation. Uh, it's been seen in some cases. Uh, it's also been seen in some controls. And then functional studies uh, and amino acid conservation and predictive algorithms go down to sort of other variant information section. So the detection rate of CSA uh, we think is going to be uh, really uh, industry leading because it combines the types of variants that you can detect by microarray 
with the types of variants you can find by whole exome sequencing. So depending on the study you're looking at, whether you're doing a trio, which, which patient population has been selected, uh, we think of microarrays as something like a 10% positive rate, maybe up to 20% in some cases. Whole exome is typically published at about 30%, especially for trios. So if you combine those two things, those are, those are independent. So when we add those up, we think the, the uh, detection rate will be about 40% by CSA, which is pretty incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's too early to do a retrospective to see that in action, but the early returns have been pretty strong. We've seen some, some interesting results already um, with this test, especially uh, with trios, as you know, that it really uh, empowers the analysis to have the parents. So we have a provider portal now. We're very flexible at Fulgen. That's sort of our design principle is to be as flexible as possible. Um, we can still take a handwritten paper requisition or a fax at any time. We've also developed this, uh, this web portal, which makes uh, ordering tests and receiving results a lot easier. Um, so you can, you can create a login for yourself as a provider uh, and, and enter your patients and order, order tests through this online service. If you make an account for yourself, you can also submit paper requisitions and we'll manually link those. We'll actually, uh, whatever you write by hand or, or print out, we'll actually uh, do the data entry for you uh, and so you can track your cases through our system. So um, we've probably seen things like this from other labs, but uh, this provider portal uh, will actually track your you know, each of your specimens throughout the process, uh, how many cases you've submitted and, and where they are. And this is for any test, not just CSA. Uh, and we also, which I, th I think is pretty cool, we do this uh, sort of tracking system. So if you want to call the lab to see where your case is, you absolutely can. If you don't want to spend that time, you can just go in and see where along the chain uh, that particular case is at any time. So as I've mentioned, we, we uh, we have a lot of different options with CSA. It's really up to you. We've designed it as a single package to make it as, as convenient as possible, but we'll still support a custom request. So for example, uh, if you want Fragile X testing, just add that. If there are any genes that you're specifically uh, concerned about for the gene, if you think, or for the patient, if you think there are uh, certain genes that we need to make sure we look at, um, that's really helpful for us. And it's not just helpful for those genes, it gives us an insight into what you're thinking. Uh, we can read your clinical note, uh, but if you say, I think it looks like, uh, you, know, you know, make sure you look at NF1, that opens up a whole sort of thought process for us that, okay, we want to look at a rathopathy type condition or, or uh, uh, phacom phacomatosis type condition. Um, so please do, please do that. Um, th this, is, this is here for you. Um, we like to think of ourselves uh, as really customer driven. So this is, uh, this is something that'll pop up on the internet occasionally where people will ask a pizza place to, to dr make a drawing on the box. So this person, uh, you know, is working a double shift and, and is really having a hard time and say, can you give us some extra motivation? And they, they drew the uh, hang in there uh, picture from, from the Simpsons. Um, and so we kind of think of ourselves that way too, like write in anything that you think would be helpful for your case. Uh, as long as it's reasonable, we will attempt to do it. We, we, we do a lot of uh, special case handling here, and we pride ourselves in being able to sort of fit into that because we know, you know, in genetics, every, every family is unique, uh, and, and you never know what you might need ahead of time. So we try to be as flexible as possible. So to summarize the benefits of CSA, It's a one specimen, one requisition, one lab, one report test. So that for you, that also means you know a, a pretest and a post test uh, for one test, and not not for five or six different tests iteratively. Uh, it includes comprehensive variant detection for genome-wide copy number analysis, UPD, small variant detection, and even exon level deletions and duplication. And we price this to be competitive with exome alone. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll show that in just a second. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, compared to, to a standard exome test for that type of price, you're also getting a microarray and Fragile X at no extra charge. As I said, duo and trio analysis and even quad analysis is available and we'll do the full sequencing. It's not just Sanger for, for interesting variants. 
And uh, the turnaround time for this test is five to seven weeks. Uh, and this, uh, this really depends on a lot of factors. Uh, if the genome-wide copy number analysis is positive, if you have a, a DeGeorge deletion on 22Q, that might get out in, in three weeks or two weeks even. Uh, that can be pretty quick. Um, whereas if we're going through the entire process of, of doing a whole exome test uh, with confirmation and might need Sanger confirmation for low quality SNP uh, or SNV or Indel, that might push it towards that seven weeks. So we really aim for five weeks. We give ourselves an extra couple weeks because it's for, for confirmatory studies to make sure we're reporting uh, true positives. So a little bit of cost analysis. This is back of the napkin. Um, but I think it, it reflects reality, uh, and this is based on list prices, and obviously there's just so many variables that go into pricing, especially with different insurance payers. Uh, but to give a broad idea here, uh, looking back at that uh, flow chart we showed at the beginning, if you have a specific diagnosis uh, and you can order a single gene test, that's going to be positive, again, three-quarters of the time or more. Uh, when it's negative, you have to go down this other tree, so that's that small percentage still adds up. If that's one out of every four cases or every five cases you think is real, that's still going to be a, a cost burden. So the, we're, we're estimating if you order a you know, single gene test or panel and, that on, and it's positive 75% of the time, the other 25% of the time you have to go and order an array and potentially uh, a panel, a larger panel, the, the average patient will cost a little over $2,000 of 2250 something like that from an institutional bill perspective. Um, for the non-syndromic cases where you're not ordering an initial test and you're, you're doing uh, microarray and fragile X up front, uh, and then that's negative 80 to 90 percent of the time, and then you have to do a panel or exome, or potentially both, those prices balloon up. So even, I think conservatively, that's going to be over $3,500 in most cases if you're doing that sort of iterative testing. Microarray prices have come down. Uh, which is great, uh, but if you're ordering a microarray and a Fragile X and a panel, that adds up pretty quickly. And so the list price for CSA, which is $2,750, uh, is considerably less. So in, you know, from we've tried to make this a test that's appealing for those uh, potentially, you know, syndromic cases or, or sorry, uh, the the idiopathic cases that don't look like any specific syndrome. If you see the patient and it doesn't ring any bells from from Smith. Uh, or you know an atypical case of any kind, you can go straight to uh, CSA, which is a more a cost-effective approach. The other area is for uh, you know very young patients, uh, NICU uh, or or less than a year old, where you don't know what symptoms they may develop in the next couple of years, but something is wrong now. Again, you might as well go for the go for the big test and and get everything rather than doing that iterative testing, which takes time and extra resources. Every test has limitations. It's important to discuss those. Um, one thing we're not detecting is gene desert CNVs. So there have been, uh, you know, you can have a deletion of a million bases in a row that does not include a gene, uh, and that would not be covered by this test because we're, we're only looking at genes. Uh, however, we've been combing the literature trying to find any evidence of a gene desert CNV that is pathogenic or likely pathogenic, um, haven't really found any. There are some that include a part of an exon, and we're aware of those, and we're kind of adding extra probes to make sure we can detect those. Uh, if you know of any gene desert CNVs, a particular regions of the genome that if deleted or duplicated uh, would cause a disease but don't include a gene, uh, we'd love to hear about that because we can design probes to make sure we catch those. Uh, but those are extremely rare. Uh, we can't detect copy-neutral structural rearrangements like a, a Robertsonian translocation. At this point, that's outside the purview of, of molecular diagnostics and still in uh, uh, molecular cytogenetics, uh, which, as you may have heard, is not supposed to be a field anymore. They've merged uh, cytogenetics with molecular, but in the lab, we're not quite ready to do copy-neutral uh, structural rearrangements. Um, that will probably come with whole genome sequencing, long reads, things that are coming in the next you know, two to five years, but we're not able to do that quite yet. Uh, CNVs, including less than an entire coding exon, I kind of alluded to this, there are certain deletions that may occur that include only a part or one exon that may be below our level of detection. And again, most microarrays are not able to detect these things either. Um, we're not yet doing prenatal. Uh, we want to be able to do prenatal on CSA. 
Uh, we just need to make sure that our copy number algorithm works on those specimen types. Uh, the copy number testing is, uh, is more sensitive to specimen type and quality than SMB detection. So uh, we can do, we actually are now offering a whole exome sequencing in the prenatal setting uh, for uh, fetal anomalies, ultrasound, ultrasound abnormalities, et cetera, but we're not able to do the, uh, the copy number detection quite yet. Uh, so we are, we are working on that. Uh, we're not doing uh, mitochondrial DNA sequencing as part of this. Uh, it is available from our lab as an add-on. Please let us know if you think your patient might have a mitochondrial DNA uh, condition. We can, we can uh, add that on. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, you know, we're, again, we're really excited to share uh, CSA with the world. Uh, and uh, I would also like to share what my menorah looks like at home. I'm celebrating uh, uh, Hanukkah for the first time with my 10-month-old. And, uh, and also have a three-year-old, and they really enjoy the Menorahsaurus. Uh, and, uh, and also, you know, obviously Christmas is coming up too, and it's Star Wars Day, so it's a very exciting time, uh, not just for chromosome sequencing analysis and molecular diagnostics, but, but for all of us. So with that, uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and take some questions. Um, so one question that we did have from the audience was, uh, can CSA detect point mutations? Um, and that is um, true. In fact, that's part of the sort of the whole exome sequencing analysis um, of the testing. Um, one question that we did have as well is, um, will the uh, absence of heterozygosity, um, will it be done on only hot spots on the chromosomes or all throughout? That's a great question. Yeah. So the AOH algorithm that we have is genome-wide. So it generates calls uh, for any region in the genome that's homozygous. Um, the question is, what do you then do with that information and how do you report it? Um, so this is, you know, for patients who are, uh, for, for families where there might be some consanguinity, where there's parental relatedness, you can, you can generate a score uh, for sort of how, what part of the genome is shared uh, identical by descent. Um, right now, we're, that's sort of beta mode because we're not sure really what the clinical relevance is there. Um, Obviously, if there is consanguinity, you want to look for homozygous point mutations, um, and you know the regions of homozygosity can be useful. So I think that's a that's a conversation to have. We're not at this time reporting out every single region that appears to be homozygous because it's, it's sort of a flood of information which is not clinically relevant. Um, but uh, that's something we can work towards. So really, the the algorithm is genome wide, but the reporting right now is focused on those those hotspot regions. Um, another question that we have is, uh, uh, what is the sensitivity of single uh, and double exonic CMV detection? Um, and uh, actually, we got that twice. So uh, okay. the sensitivity and the specificity of the, of the CMV uh, detection. Yeah, so, we, so our initial studies um, were showing that uh, our sensitivity for multiple exon deletions and duplications is about 95%. Uh, we, we're currently working on a large-scale uh, second confirmation because we now have thousands of qPCR results. Um, that's a much bigger study uh, than our initial validation, uh, and actually, it's looking even better. So it's, it's uh, you know, I, I would be uh, putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but I, I you know, th those values will be 96 to 98 percent sensitivity for exon deletions of two or greater. Now that is within the gene list. We're not doing genome-wide uh, exon level CNV because there are so many of the potential signals. So that is also a phenotype driven approach for those really small things. Uh, for one exon, uh, that is limited to some specific genes at this point. Um, so genes which only have one exon, we have to test those. Uh, for for uh, uh, If we have a strong suspicion of Duchenne or cystic fibrosis, we'll look for single exon DELs and dupes. There's a few others like that. Uh, if you ha again, if, if this that's a very difficult thing to do genome wide because there's so many signals. Uh, but if there's a single gene that's of particular interest, we can just do the you know we we can we can look for those signals and do any qPCRs. So the single exon ones are usually negative. Um, we haven't seen a ton of those, but we've we've seen a, seen a few. And frankly, we don't have enough data because they're so rare to even say what our sensitivity is, we don't have enough true positives of single exons across many different genes 
uh, to look at. So really, the focus is on those multiple exon genes. Uh, multiple exon delta and dupes at this point. Um, another question that we had is, what is the average depth of coverage um, for our whole exome sequencing panel? Great question. So the the minimum coverage um, for uh, for genes in the the, the coverage of the genes in the gene list overall. So it's an overall coverage, not a gene by gene coverage, but the, the overall is minimum 20x of 96% of the coding sequences. Uh, the average coverage is higher, it's more like 80 to 90x coverage. Okay, and um, another question here is kind of a long one. Um, with the iterative CMV SMV analysis, what is Fulgen's approach to the concept of the oligogenetics model of di for disease manifestation, where multiple pathogenic CMVs and SMVs uh, hits of the coding and non-coding regions can impact disease severity? Would genome sequencing be recommended for negative cases? So interesting questions there. I mean, I think at some level the 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 clinical world is always going to be behind the research world, and I don't think the research world is there yet with oligogenic inheritance. And we've seen we've seen some cool advances in, especially in recessive hypomorphic disease, where you have a variant that is benign if it's homozygous, but pathogenic if it's a compound het with a more severe mutation. We've seen that for a kidney disease and for Stargardt disease, which I studied in my postdoc. Uh, is in terms of multiple conditions and sort of adding up to be pathogenic, you have one CNB and one point mutation. Um, that's something we're going to keep an eye on the literature to see where that goes because right now it's just it's not going to ever meet clinical significance if you follow the guidelines. So there are always going to be a couple of BUS uh, and even potentially, you know, what we think of now is likely benign variants may get reclassified as hypomorphic or oligogenic in the future. I think just the limitations of a, a clinical setting, we would be we'd be overstepping our bounds to to try to report those types of things at this time. In terms of for negative cases, um, you know, whole genome sequencing right now has, in my opinion, limited additional benefit. Um, the main benefits of whole genome sequencing right now is that it, it, certain institutions can do them very rapidly. So I'm sure you've heard of the Rady Children's and the University of uh, uh, Wisconsin Milwaukee groups. Uh, that have tried to do uh, one to two week rapid turnaround time for genome sequencing in the NICU um, because you don't have to do target capture, uh, which takes about three days in the laboratory. You can do it, you can turn around a whole genome potentially faster. Um, you know, but in this case, if you've already done a CSA test, it's negative, that's not really a benefit that you're getting. The next benefit, obviously, is looking at more intronic variants um, and promoter variants and, and untranslated regions and things like that. Um, Right now, there just aren't enough known pathogenic variants in that com in that uh, compartment of the genome to be of much benefit. So I think if you have cases uh, where there's a very strong clinical uh, signal that there's a genetic disease and this test is negative, I think the next step is really research. I think the next step is things like the uh, the uh, undiagnosed disease network program from the NIH to enroll families through deep phenotyping with whole genome sequencing on a research basis to discover novel genes. Because again, this is a clinical test. It's not designed to discover new genes. We occasionally do, uh, if you send a trio, there's a de novo loss of function and a gene that's in the right pathway. You know, even that's still going to be a VUS because we haven't published our own paper yet. And you know, that, so that type of thing takes time. So. Um, you know, right now, I don't see an enormous benefit to going to whole genome sequencing following a negative test in a clinical setting. I would really recommend reaching out to those researchers who are, who are doing the, the cutting edge research. Um, does adding on tests to CSA add to the cost? So if they were doing a mitochondrial add-on? So right now, the mitochondrial add-on is, is an additional charge. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but th that would be additional. Anything where you say, you know, please look at this gene or that gene, that would be included, fragile X is included. Um, and, you know, try it, let us know. We won't charge you first without telling you what the charge would be. So if you want some type of add-on, um, give it a try, uh, and, and we'll get back to you and have a conversation about that, because I'm sure that's going to be something really specific. But my, the MitoDNA is, is, a, is really handled as a, as a completely separate test right now. Um, do you add additional probes in the CSA for copy number variants besides the probes used for the regular whole exome sequencing? 
Uh, our capture sets are enhanced, uh, so we work off of a framework of commercially available kits, but we do we do enhancements. Um, and uh, let's see. Our um, one question, sorry, I lost it just here. Um, am I correct in understanding that all the testing is performed based off of NGS? Uh, nearly all. The, the exception would be the confirmatory studies by QPCR, potentially MLPA, Sanger, uh, and then Fragile X, we're doing repeat prime PCR, the standard Assure Gen kit. Um, what is the minimum number of exons allowable for CMB detection? So that's two. And what samples do you draw from uh, for the CMB controls? Uh, that's a good question. So um, the most beneficial controls are those that are sequenced within the same library. Because we're doing high volume sequencing, um, we have enough controls in, uh, in the batch to provide the best the best controls. We can also um, expand that a bit so our algorithm does more than just that, but that's the standard controls are the ones in the batch. Okay. And um, one last question is, uh, is there an option for reanalysis within a certain time frame, um, free of charge, such as if there's you know, new phenotypes developed, um, like you were saying, if it was a NICU and now right. he is right. you know, older. So I'd say that's evolving. Um, we don't have a firm policy right now uh, for reanalysis. If there are, if there really are new phenotypes and looking like a different condition, we would do a new gene list. Um, that's typically something we would provide one reanalysis, uh, you know, a, a year or so out. Uh, in terms of just, you know, can you please check again uh, for for new variants? That's going to be a new charge if there's no change in phenotype. Uh, we will also uh, look at, you know, we we do. Uh, some variant reclassification, we check the U.S.'s. We don't check all the U.S.'s all the time because it's a tremendous amount of variants. We have tens of thousands of the U.S. that we've generated. We can't possibly re-review them all the time. Uh, so we do our best to keep up with reclassification. But if you have a question about a variant that we've reported, we will take a look at that variant really at, at any time. So if you come back six months or a year later and say, is this the U.S. still a U.S.? We'll, we'll definitely take a look at that. As far as looking at new variants, if the phenotype hasn't changed, um, that will typically be a charge for reanalysis. Um, and I think that was the last question. Um, if there are any further questions that we do um, come across as, as we're um, kind of cleaning this up, um, we will uh, email you offline. Um, and uh, you know, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, Sam, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And again, thanks, you know, thanks for your attention and, and happy holidays. Take care, everybody.